The Raja Empat Islands of Indonesia, hot, humid and rife with malaria. Nobody knows for sure what lives in these remote forests, but this part of the world has always been home to giant reptiles. One of them is a huge lizard called the tree crocodile. It could be the biggest lizard in the world. Thomas Schulz Westrom doesn't look like a hero, but he is. A German zoologist, he's trying to find out more about the animals that live in this isolated region. Thomas is based in Indonesia's easternmost province, Irian Jaya. He lives just off the mainland on a small island called Batanta, one of the Raja Empat group. The forests on these islands are a wildlife paradise, but their future's looking bleak. The loggers are starting to move in. Right across Indonesia, forests are being felled at a devastating rate. But Thomas believes there may be a way to save the Raja Empat forests. He recently captured this rare footage of a tree crocodile. It's only a small one, but the local people say they grow up to 13 feet long. If that's true, they're the longest lizards in the world and their very existence could be the key to protecting the area. It's happened before. Seven hundred miles southwest of Batanta is Komodo Island, one of the first national parks created in Indonesia. This is why the Komodo dragon. At up to ten feet long and built like a tank, it's as near as you can get to a living dinosaur. People come from all over the world to see these giant lizards. I'm Mark Strickson, a zoologist and natural history filmmaker with a special interest in reptiles. When I heard that Thomas was searching for another giant lizard, the tree crocodile, I was really keen to help. I'm on my way to join him, but I couldn't resist stopping off on Komodo to see the famous dragons. It's very early in the morning. The sun's not even up beyond the hills and it's the best time of day to see big lizards. Adult Komodos have killed and eaten humans before now, so you've really got to know what you're doing when you're in dragon country. These rocks that I'm on are an ideal basking spot for lizards. And there's one here. I need to move really slowly and carefully from now on. You stay there, guys. Like all reptiles, dragons are cold-blooded. They're solar-powered and need to warm up in the sun before they can be active. Early morning is the only time you can safely approach them. doesn't even know I'm here. If I keep absolutely still, I should be safe. He's a big animal for a Komodo. He's got to be almost nine feet, and they don't grow much bigger than this. Now, he'd have no trouble bringing a deer or a wild pig down. And I tell you what, they'd probably put up a better fight than me. He's starting to move and I'd be a fool to stick around much longer. The dragons were amazing. 
but I'm keen to press on and meet up with Thomas. He's waiting for me in Sarong, the nearest town to his camp on Batanta. This is Pete. He's a local and one of the very few that speak English. He's very well respected in the area and Thomas is lucky to have him on his team. And there's Thomas. After endless letters and phone calls, it's good to finally meet up. It's five weeks since we last spoke, so I'm eager to hear if he's got anything new to report. Well, Mark, since we've spoken last, yeah. there was some very, very exciting reports from Batanta, which is one of the islands where I was telling you about in the Mugaja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we've got a map. Nurdin, have you got the map with you? OK, great. Right. That's a good. Nurdin's an expert tracker. His skills are going to be crucial. And you see on the northern coast, there is a lot of uh, fjords and bays, and there are islands like yeah. here, Rambao. Yeah, yeah. And people have found big ones on all along this coast, about six different... Uh, I don't know, you, you, you believe these reports, yeah? You think they're telling well, the truth? Well, I do, because if I see their faces when they tell me the stories, yeah. you instantly believe. It sounds promising, so we head straight out to our base camp. My first sight of Batanta, and it's even better than I expected. Steep slopes, cloud cover, virgin rainforest coming right the way down to the sea. There are so few places in the world where you can see this sort of landscape. Indonesia is one of the most biologically rich countries in the world. Over 500 species of mammal live here, and around 17% of the world's bird species. It's a paradise for zoologists. Yeah, finally. Yes, it is. Looks great. Yeah. Well, Mark, this is the house. All natural, no nail, mm -hmm. local material, palm roof, lots of space. You can choose any room you want. And it backs. Right onto the rainforest. I mean, oh it's yeah. Wonderful. yeah, palm cockadoos come right every yeah. morning, and up in the back you have Phyglectus parrot. You have all kinds of things, and a bit further back you have birds of paradise. This is the spectacular red bird of paradise, and these are Wilson's bird of paradise. They're only found on Batanta, and that's typical of many of the animals around here. They're unique to just one island. Indonesia was once attached to Australia by a land bridge. And that's why you find a lot of marsupials here, like this wallaby. But for Thomas and I, the most wonderful things are the reptiles. So far, more than 400 species have been discovered. This is a green tree python. And believe it or not, this is also a green tree python, but it's a young one. It's possible that the patterning provides camouflage against predators by disguising the snake's body shape. Here's another one. This beautiful lizard is a green tree monitor, a close relative of the tree crocodile. Its long limbs and massive claws are designed for climbing. Now everything I know about lizards tells me that the tree crocodile might be longer than the Komodo dragon, but it won't be as bulky. As a tree dweller, it's got to be agile. Batanta lies almost on the equator, 
and by six o'clock the sun is going down, going down fast. And then the clouds roll in and the rains come. It's not called rainforest for nothing. It's been a long day for me and I need an early night. At least at base camp I've got a dry bed and can get a good night's sleep. Once we're out in the forest, it's going to be a very different story. Almost every day, people come into Thomas's camp with animals caught during logging operations. It's a sad indicator of what's going on. These animals are from Salawati, a neighbouring island. What's so exciting is that you never know what's in the bag. It could contain a species of animal we've never even heard of. No, don't do that. I'm just going out. Relax. Oh, Oops. you know what I'm doing? I go in the kitchen and get some greens. Maybe it's here. Oh. This little tree kangaroo was really lucky to have been brought into our camp and not taken to some animal trader. The market for exotic pets results in thousands of animals being illegally exported from Indonesia each year. Most of them die in transit. At least we can buy this little kangaroo and release him somewhere safe. Let's see what's in the other bag, Thomas. Uh, come on. This. Oh, oh isn't he wonderful? This is an amethystine python. And, <laughs> interestingly enough, it's the main predator of tree kangaroos. And they've got to be one of the most beautiful snakes in the rainforest. Wow. <laughs> Both these animals are nocturnal, so we'll wait until tonight to release them. For now, we'll put them in a quiet place so they can rest. Meanwhile, Thomas and I are off to meet a man who says his magic powers can summon tree crocodiles from the forest. Today we're heading for the nearest village, Amdui. The missionaries did a thorough job here converting the people to Christianity, but some of the old beliefs still exist. Carrying the chickens is Charles, the man we've come to meet. Thomas is skeptical about his claims, but I've only got three weeks and I want to follow up every lead we've got. <laughs> Mangrove swamp supports a huge variety of animals. These are mudskippers. It's hard to believe it, but they're actually fish. And these fiddler crabs are the staple diet of many animals that live amongst the mangroves, including lizards. Charles has built himself an altar and he's putting offerings on it. Tobacco, salt, beans, all things that are valuable to the local people. It's interesting to see that Nerdin and Pete are as fascinated as we are. They've never seen anything like this. Now it's making sense. Charles has killed one of the chickens and is putting it on the fire. Lizards have a really good sense of smell, and as the smell of chicken drifts through the mangroves, they'll be attracted in. And it doesn't take long. This is a peach-throated monitor. It's a really exciting find for us. Peach-throated monitors are rarely seen, and like many of the animals in this area, very little is known about them.
but despite a promising start, we didn't see any more lizards that day, let alone a tree crocodile. As we got back to camp, the rain set in again, and we knew we had a really wet night ahead of us. We needed to release the animals brought in that morning. The snake was easy, but tree kangaroos only eat certain leaves. Thomas had to search the forest for the right kind of tree. Good foliage, easy climbing. There you go. He looks all right. He started feeding already. Good luck, mate. Night time's a really good time for spotting animals in the rainforest. This is a couscous. Like the wallaby and the tree kangaroo, it's a marsupial common to Indonesia and Australia. And these are striped possums, two young ones. You're incredibly lucky if you see these animals in the wild. They're rare and very shy. They're insect eaters, and as they move across the branches, they tap the bark gently, listening for the hollow sound of an insect's burrow. There's plenty of activity on the forest floor as well. You know what this is? Be careful, be careful, very yeah. careful. I can tell you, it's a venomous snake. <laughs> it's just like the Australian elapids, the most deadly snakes in the world. Mark, be very careful. This is Ularputi. Ularputi means white snake. And it's very much feared by the locals here. People have died within hours. Right, thank you for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> right, I found it under that log. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful, though, oh, the, the, the colour? Yeah. I've seen one white snake before in my life in Australia. Again, a nocturnal snake like this. And I guess it's camouflage. Uh, yeah, the moonlight coming down through the forest trees. They, they look yes. like a moonlit stick. He may be venomous, but he's very beautiful, isn't he? Now, <laughs> oh. now, oh, now, now he's getting tired. I'm going to have to let him go. He's trying to find cover, though, you see. He doesn't want to be near me. He's much more frightened of me than I am of him. So off you go, mate. Go on, back towards your log. Go on, I'll let him go. There he goes. Good hunting. When we finally get back to camp, Thomas and I identify the snake as a New Guinea small eyed snake. Yet another species to add to Thomas's record. hunting today, pig hunting. There's a good reason why. As the dogs run through the forest, they flush out lizards. It's the best chance I've got to see my first tree crocodile. Feral pigs are found on virtually every large island in the region, and they're an important source of food for the locals. But hunting them is dangerous work. In the rainforest, even a small cut can quickly become infected by virulent bacteria, and that can lead to major health problems. Even antibiotics won't help you. This is really tough going. I'm used to the heat, but it's like working out in a sauna. Itu sasa. This is a blue tail monitor. <laughs> and they don't usually climb up trees. They're usually only found on the ground, but what he was trying to do there was escape from me. 
He's a lovely animal. Oh, but he's being a bit aggressive, and that's absolutely typical of the lizards that we're going to see on this trip. There are five species of monitor, one of which is the tree crocodile, this is one of the others. Now they're all fast, they're all quite aggressive, and there's a very good reason why. The things that they hunt, like rats, birds, other lizards, they're fast as well, and they fight back. So these are good fighters. Look at this tail, isn't it gorgeous? Look at that blue coloration, absolutely wonderful patterning. But you saw how quickly he was going up that tree. Okay, he hunts on the ground, but look at these front claws. He can grab on with them and get up a tree pretty fast. And if I turn him over very gently, it's okay. You can see he's got a beautiful marbled underbelly. Now, these folds on the skin mean it's quite a long time since he's eaten, but he's a mature animal. Lizards have to be opportunistic hunters. They do go through times when they don't get much food, but he'll be all right. He's an adult, he's been through hard times before, and I'm sure he'll get out of them. Come on. Ooh, here you are. There we go. Off he goes. We walked all day long, making slower and slower progress as we climbed up into the hills. No more lizards. Once again, luck wasn't on our side, and you need luck in the rainforest. There are tree crocodiles out there, but they're staying well hidden. Another frustration is that because we're on the equator, it always gets dark at six. You have to stop and pitch camp. But talks around the campfire can be really useful. It's usually quite hard to get the locals to open up, but as the night goes on, they tell us about their encounters with tree crocodiles. This man says he was out hunting when one dropped from the trees. It attacked his dogs and blinded one of them. At the time he saw, and then he saw this animal climb the tree, and he said that because it's too, it was too big, so when it climbed back and then fall down again. Ah. So he climbed for the second time. It's been a long day. We've come quite high up into the hills. And since we saw the blue-tailed monitor this morning, we haven't seen another large animal. Plenty of birds up in the canopy. They're there because that's where the food is in a rainforest. Down on the forest floor, there's not much light. So there's not much vegetation, you don't get grazing animals. The only animals that can survive down there are carnivores, like the lizards, feeding on rats and ground-dwelling birds. So one lizard this morning, that's a pretty good result. And I'm sure we'll see some more tomorrow. It's hard going, but we've got to stay positive. The moment the sun rose the next morning, we knew it was going to be a scorcher. The hunters decide to take us to some caves up in the mountains. On a day like this, reptiles can easily overheat and caves provide perfect shelter. As we climb further up, the forest opens out and there are many more birds. There's a lot more fruit about too, and the hornbills are having a feast. No lizards, but there's a snake. <laughs> Come on, it's obviously a bit of an aggressive snake, this one. He's big. Come on, come on. There we are. That's it. That's it. Ooh, mouth open. This is a black-headed python. It's an Albertus python. But he's a wonderful specimen. He's very big. Oh, thank you. Thank you, mate. Ooh, come on. Yep, we yep. Oh, it's having a little go. Yeah. He's just investigating me with his tongue. Mm-hmm. Probably feeling some difference in temperature. 
Yeah, I should think so. I'm pretty hot. <laughs> you heated up from outside. <laughs> Pythons detect their prey by body heat. That's why he's interested in me. Like his prey, the rat, I'm warm-blooded, but I'm bigger than any rat he's ever come across. The snake was a good find, but we didn't see much else that day. Even the pig hunters were disappointed. It was time to move on. Our next search area is Batanta's north coast. But first, there's an unscheduled stop. Our boatman's offered some fishermen friends a lift to Iggin Island. It's out of our way, but we've heard it's another good place for lizards. The village is really isolated. So it's a shock to see gravel extraction going on. The villagers tell us the noise has driven the wildlife away. It's really depressing. Nowhere in the world is safe from exploitation. The journey gives Thomas a chance to talk to the fishermen and their families. He learns that they fish around Iggin because it's surrounded by good coral reef. A lot of the reef in the area has been destroyed by dynamite fishing. At Iggin, it's still pristine and the marine life is spectacular. Whilst the fishermen catch lunch, Thomas and I head inland. It's hellishly hot and the going is slow. We're in mangrove country again. <laughs> Thomas is just showing off. This is pretty much like hell for me. I'm being bitten to death by mosquitoes, and it doesn't come much harder than walking across a mangrove swamp. But it's perfect for the animals we're looking for. It's almost midday and way too hot for lizards to be out in the open. Right now they'll be sheltering from the heat in the surrounding forest. Not such a bad idea. This is a good sign, termites. Termite mounds are kept at a constant temperature and many lizards use them as incubators for their eggs. Good trick, that one. Yeah. You see, there's quite a big hole. Mm. No snake inside. Let's see how I can get there. It looks, oh, look at this. <laughs> wow. Oh, maybe more. This is so special. I've got to say, he's cute, isn't he? Isn't he dead cute? <laughs> it's a baby mangrove monitor. We've got more. More? Yeah, look at this. Oh. Look at this. I've never seen this before, it's ever. Yes. Uh, now, in crocodiles, they stay together, the young, for quite a long time after they hatch and the mother looks after them. The locals told us they'd seen mothers with little lizards like this going around the forest. We weren't sure whether to believe them, but it's obviously true. This is what's so amazing about travelling in this part of the world. You discover something new every oh. day. They're still already using their tails. Oh, he's going! Oh, he's gone back in! Oh, that's good. <laughs> anyway, that's Let's the way pop them back in. Oops. Back on the shore, they're cooking lunch, and smoke is drifting out over the forest, 
just like it did with Charlie's. Let's hope it brings the lizards in. Here they come. More mangrove monitors. Big ones too. He tells me that the lizards are sacred to the fishermen. They believe that if they give the lizards a portion of their fish, fish will always be plentiful around the island. There's a similar belief held on Komodo Island about the dragons. This one must be almost six feet long. It was a real treat to see the mangrove monitors, but what we're really after is tree crocodiles. We need to press on to our next stop, Yensuai. The people here are really friendly. That's just as well. We want to do a thorough survey of the forest, and we're going to need all the help we can get. While I have fun, Thomas is trying to get permission for us to go into the forest. It's sacred to the villagers and they're very protective of it. Fortunately, the village elder is sympathetic. The next morning we're able to start our search and there are plenty of volunteers to help us. The villagers are nervous though and want to pray before we start. I can understand their fears. The forest is a dangerous place. They pray that we won't get lost, that the animals we meet won't hurt us, and that we'll all come out of the forest safely. Okay. Pete, can you get them organised in four groups of six, okay? We're splitting up so that we can do a systematic search of the forest. Thomas will stick to the lowlands with his two groups and the rest of us will go up into the mountains. Yet again, it's dense, oppressive jungle, very easy to get lost in, and climbing in this heat and humidity really saps you. <laughs> it looks like a good area for tree crocodiles. Mature trees, plenty of them. Rocky outcrops, which provide shade for them during the middle of the day. What we're looking for is scratches on the trees. Tree crocodiles tend to have a, a roost in a tree and they'll go up and down the same tree so you can tell where they are. Further up the mountain, we come across a massive cave system. None of the men I'm with have ever visited these caves, but they've heard about them. During the Second World War, people from their village came up here to hide from the Japanese. There are some incredibly long poles going up into the roof, and it soon becomes clear what they were used for. Bats make good food. By the time we got back to the beach, we were completely exhausted. And after all that effort, I was really disappointed not to have found anything. Fortunately, Thomas had had more luck. He'd found good evidence that there were large lizards living in the area.
I just had to see what he discovered. Looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. It's much better than anything I saw. Now, what we've got here is a clear path running down the hillside. Something's using it regularly, you can see. All the leaves being taken away here off the earth. There's no sign it's a pig. There's no pig hooves. So it must be a lizard, and it's a fairly sizable one. And at the top there, you can see there are scratches on that branch crossing the path, which means it's being used at the moment. It must have been used in the last couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely set some traps here. It's good. Trapping isn't ideal, but if we want to find out if these lizards really are here, there's no option. What we can do is make absolutely sure that the traps can't hurt the animals. We get the locals to make them from lianas, not rope or wire, which could cause damage. The other thing we're going to have to do is check the traps regularly. Over the next few days, we set traps in a couple of other promising sites. Then it was just a waiting game. Thomas spent his time talking to the locals. Most of them had stories to tell about tree crocodiles. But were they true? Or were they just telling Thomas what he wanted to hear? As for me, every day I went to check the traps. But it was a pretty depressing task. They were always empty. Yen Suai had appeared to be our best bet. Thomas had told me this was where we were almost certain to see a big tree crocodile. But I just couldn't see it happening. Thomas. Oh, Mark, there you are. How was it going? Pretty bad. Oh. There's nothing taking the bait. There weren't even any tracks today, mm. so... I don't know, I've got a limited amount of time. Yeah. Uh, no, I know that, Mark. Yeah. I've seen hardly mm. any ground running birds, yeah. right? Which is a major source of food for sure. them. We've had hardly any lizards in. Yeah. We've had a few, but hardly any. Even if there is a big tree crocodile out there, it must have a massive territory. No, we're, I mean, we're looking lots, for a needle yeah. in a haystack, Tom. Well, yeah. The animals are certainly there. The people have seen them. Yeah. We had several good reports, as you know. Yeah. But of course, it's a very large area and the forest, everything is hidden. The only other place we've had decent reports yeah. is Salawati, right? Mm -hmm. And I know it's a long way, but I, I think we've got to cut our losses here and move out. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I agree. I'm just a bit fed up. <laughs> I imagine. Sorry for that. That's anyway. all right. I'll just get myself cleaned up, get changed, okay, all right? Then. See you later. After dismantling our traps, we set off on the long journey to Salawati's east coast. I don't really know where we are. We're headed, coming in from the coast from Salawati into a major river system. Everybody else is asleep. The rainforest is an incredible place. You go in there and for the first 15 minutes you can you can taste the oxygen. You, you can almost smell it. But after that the humidity hits you and it's a perfect breeding ground for germs. And we're starting to really suffer. Nerdin's got a bad eye infection. Thomas has got a skin infection. I've got the beginnings of a tropical ulcer. And Pete's just plain shattered. We arrived very late at night on the second day of travelling. Word of our visit had got there before us. Even the children were still waiting up to see us. We've come to see a man called Kamarudin. He's a local pig hunter and he has dozens of traps set in the forest nearby. He tells us that he regularly catches tree crocodiles in his traps. This is good news, but really bad news is to follow. Finally, 
uh, he would like to keep it for us, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's already rotten. So he just measure it and then throw it in the water. Oh. <laughs> The worst news I can possibly have. I don't believe what I've just heard. Last week, he caught a tree crocodile over 10 feet long. It died in the pig trap. But the worst part is, he didn't keep it. He threw it in the river. It could have been the one animal we were after, the longest lizard in the world. But there's no evidence. Still, tomorrow is another day, and if what Kamarudin says is true, then at least we're in the right area. And things look promising as soon as we get into the forest. There are lots more animals for a start. Megapode birds. Their eggs, which they lay in these huge nesting mounds, are a favourite food of lizards. Let's get this noose. Quick, 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 fast. Oh, what a snake. That's huge. I've never seen this. is an olive no. python, isn't it? I've never seen one. It's yeah. anything like the size of this. All right. Fortunately, this huge olive python is unharmed. It can't have been in the trap for long, and it's a good thing Thomas and I are with the hunter. Normally, a python this big would end up in the cooking pot. There we are, it's happier now. It's okay, it's got my arm. Mm. That'll give him something to grab onto. Yeah. There's an old wound here. Oh, yes. But it's okay. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be hurt. Well, he's gone through a lot yeah. of things in his life. Yeah. Look, this is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It's well fed. Yeah. So, uh, let him go. Yeah, I think we just let yeah. it go now. Okay. Okay, off to you. It's a massive snake, and that's another good sign. If a snake can grow to this size, then lizards can probably reach large sizes too. Despite all the disappointment so far, I'm feeling more hopeful. Everything's really big around here, even the millipedes. It's not the giant we're after, but he is a tree crocodile. Do that noose. Ah! Oh! Those claws are sharp. Yeah. Trying to open the noose. Okay, here we are. Get him on the floor. Well, this is fantastic. You know, when I came out here, I wasn't really sure if I was going to see one of these. This is a real treat. And you can see why the locals call them the star lizard. Just look at that beautiful patterning. That's it. Calm down, mate. You're not going <clears> anywhere. <throat> He's been in the wars a bit. This nose here is quite badly injured, but it's healed well, and he probably had a fight with another lizard. But he's a survivor. But he must be... He must be almost six feet, Thomas. It's got this huge tail. That's where the length in their body is. This tail they use for climbing around the trees. Look at that. Mm. That's incredible. Do you see how all the loose skin on his body has been taken up and his flesh has filled it and his body's become a flat plate? Now, do you remember telling me that you'd seen them flying from tree to tree? Yeah, about 45 yeah. degrees. Yeah, There's, that's their parachute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at that. It's huge. Look. The moment we came into this forest, I could hear more birds, we saw more animals. I just knew in my bones that it was a good place. And there's no reason that this little fellow of six feet, well, that's not really that small in terms of lizards. That's still a big lizard. There's no reason he shouldn't grow to 11, 12 feet. Look after yourself. What a find. It's a spectacular lizard. 
This makes up for everything we've been through. And now we know where their stronghold is, Thomas can really start to find out more about these incredible animals. One thing's for sure, unlike his heavy cousin, the Komodo dragon, he's long and graceful, perfectly adapted to life in the trees. As he climbs, you can see just how long his amazing tail is. That's where the length is. We're starting to lose him. You'd never spot him up in the canopy if you didn't know he was there. While we were away in the forest, word of our search has spread round the village. The lady who lives in this house tells us a big lizard's been coming into her garden. She doesn't know whether it's a tree crocodile, but from the description she gives us, it's definitely worth checking out. The house is surrounded by thick bush and it's going to be difficult to spot the animal. But it's good for the lizard. There's plenty of ground cover and plenty of food. There he is. It's definitely a tree crocodile. He's big, about eight feet long, but he's in very poor condition. That's why he's come into the village. He's so hungry, he can't resist the chance of an easy meal. Just like a snake, he bides his time, waiting for a chance to strike. Oh! It's been a great end to my trip. Two tree crocodiles and one around eight feet long. According to the locals, they grow bigger. I believe them, and it's a matter of time before Thomas proves that they're the longest lizards in the world. I'm heading home now, but I'll be back when he finds the big one. It's out there somewhere. The work Thomas is doing is really important. Proof that there's a remarkable lizard on these remote islands may help save the forests. But it's a race against time. One thing's certain, the Thomases of this world need all the help they can get. <laughs> Logomaya, 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 Logoma